Hallelujah. Well, I do have a word that I want to share with you about this specific place that we are in time, this specific moment in history. Um, I want to read, if you've got your Bibles, which I'm sure everybody does, turn to Mark chapter 4. We ended up there last week. Uh, I don't know if we ended up there, but uh, last week I preached on no fear here, the difference in fear and faith. And uh, boy, what a time that we had. And one of the things that I shared was out of this very story. So Mark chapter 4, we know the, the, the story. Uh, Jesus preaches to the multitudes about the sower sows the word. The sower sows the word. That's what it says in verse 14. Verse 13, he says, if you don't know this parable, you don't know any of the parables. <laughs> Hallelujah. So Jesus, in his own words, said that this parable is the most important one if you're going to understand the things that he uh, was sharing to us all through his earthly ministry on the kingdom of God. But now at the end of that day, he finishes teaching the multitudes. He gets back to his own uh, 12. He gets back there, uh, I jokingly say, in the green room, but they get back uh, to their own private place in whatever house or wherever they were located. And uh, he explains to the disciples the meaning of this parable. Now, after a long day, a long day of ministry, he tells the disciples, we're going to the other side. Verse 35, he said, let us pass over unto the other side. And so we see here that Jesus is setting them up to go someplace. He's setting them up to go a certain place. There's a course that's been charted for them. Jesus Christ, the head of the church, told them, we're going to the other side. He said that that's where they're going. And so when they had, uh, verse 36 says, when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. Does that sound like today's times? I understand that, that uh, this is a literal storm, and, and some of you may think, well, this, this maybe isn't a real storm we're going through. Oh, yeah, it's a real storm. I know personally, I know people, I've talked to them, who this, this whole shutdown and quarantine and everything that's going on right now is affecting their family, it's affecting their paychecks, it's affecting who they are as a family. Um, it, it, let me say, not who they are as a family, how they operate as a family, um, their, their uh, financial identity and some things like that uh, seem to be taking on water. The ship of their life seems to be taking on water right now. And uh, verse 38 says, He was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say to him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? In other words, they woke him up and said, Jesus, don't you care what's going on here? <laughs> don't you care? I've heard this week um, some awful things, awful things in the media, awful things on Facebook and different things. Doesn't God care about this coronavirus? Doesn't God care about what we're going through? Did God send this storm? A lot of people are wondering if he sent the storm. My goodness, hallelujah, just a basic Bible knowledge would be able to clear that up really quickly. But there, this is a, a problem that didn't just happen in a ship some 2,000 years ago. Sometimes people today are saying, Jesus, don't you care? And he arose. He rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Now, I want you to notice something. He didn't just speak to the storm. He spoke, and we talk about the storm all the time, but we talk uh, very little about the second thing that he said. Number one, he said uh, he rose in verse 39, and he rebuked the wind, and then he said to the sea. I want you to see this. He rebuked the wind, and then he spoke to the sea and said, peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was great calm on the sea. <laughs> and he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Now, that was for last week. Watch last week's video, and I talked a little bit more about that verse in particular. But then verse 41 says, then they feared exceedingly and said to one another, what manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now, this is, I've, I've never heard anybody preach on the wind and the sea before, and, and, um, and I, I'm really not preaching on the wind and the sea other than to say right now, today, uh, the wind 
It is representative of the principalities and rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. There are always going to be turbulences that are going on in the jet stream of the atmosphere of your life that will affect your road or your course. I know this wasn't a road, this was a sea. This was a way that they were going to travel to get to a destination. Jesus already said, we're going to the other side. We're gonna get there by sea. We're going to get there by sea. And the wind arose. Ooh. The wind arose to trouble the road that they were on, the path that they were supposed to take. Understand, I know it's a sea, it's not a road. I understand what I'm saying. The, the turbulence was in the atmosphere to stop them from being able to take the road that Jesus called them to take or the pathway or the journey that he called them to take to get to the destination that he knew they were supposed to be. Glory be to God. This is doing something all over me right now. Hallelujah. Oh, praise the Lord Jesus. Now, I want to read to you, though, in verse 39, I want to read it out of the Amplified Bible. Amplified Bible, Mark 4, 39 says, And he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush now, be still, be muzzled. <laughs> be muzzled. And the wind ceased, sank to rest as if exhausted by its beating. <laughs> Jesus absolutely whipped the atmosphere. <laughs> He beat the atmosphere at its own game. It arose and it had a voice to it. And it was speaking to those men in that boat. It said to them, you're not going to the other side. In fact, you're going to end up at the bottom of this sea if you don't watch out. <laughs> Glory to God. It sank. Oh, I love that. Sank to rest as if exhausted by its beating. And there was immediately, everybody in your living room, say immediately, a great calm a perfect peacefulness. So I've got a little bit of a word here that I want to share on this specific situation that I've called put a muzzle on it. Put a muzzle on it. You guys know what a muzzle is? Any of you that have a dog, maybe uh, you guys know what a muzzle is more than the non-dog owners, but a muzzle is something that fixes that voice, stops that voice from being able to speak to you. And so I'm declaring to you right now, wherever you are listening to this, put a muzzle on it. Put a muzzle, not on your mouth. In fact, we're gonna see here in a second that putting a muzzle on the storm, on the virus, on the sickness, on the disease, Putting a muzzle on it requires you to take the muzzle off of your mouth. <laughs> Glory be to God. Take the muzzle off of your mouth and put a muzzle on that storm because that storm is talking to you. The atmosphere all around you is speaking to you right now. Oh, they're going to start laying off people down there. Production's going to go down. Sales are down at my company. And, and because of this virus, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get groceries. And if I can't get down to the grocery store, there won't be any toilet paper. And, if, and, you know, blah, 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 blah. All kinds of stuff going on. And I'm here to tell you by the authority of Christ Jesus that we have the very way, the answer. I've got the answer on the inside of me. You've got the answer on the inside of you if you're in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. I did a little bit of research on this coronavirus. This is obviously being recorded today, um, but this, what I'm about to share with you is true of any storm. It's true of any mountain that's going to come if the Lord tarries and somebody watches this video 50 years from now. It's going to be just as true 50 years from now at some other virus or some other storm that's coming up as it is right now at this moment with you sitting in your living room. It is going to absolutely be the way for you to live a life of victory. You're called to muzzle the storm for the rest of your life. Glory be to God. So I read about this coronavirus. Hallelujah. I read an article from Johns Hopkins, and the article was called, What is Coronavirus? You can look it up. Google it yourself. At the very end of the article, this is what hit me. 
It's named a coronavirus, and this is just the latest coronavirus. This is 19. Uh, there have been other coronaviruses. They're named for their appearance, the article said. Under microscope, the virus looks like it is covered with pointed structures that surround it like a crown. The Latin word for crown is corona. And as I read this, something hit me on the inside of me, went all over me. Hopefully the same thing that's going all over you, we listen to the same Holy Spirit. When I read that, I immediately saw that word crown. It stuck out to me. Oh, and then I looked at pictures. Then I Googled images of what the coronavirus looks like under microscope, and that's exactly what it does. Looks like a crown. All the points, you guys have seen the, uh, the crown. Anybody ever, I'm 42 years old, anybody who was a kid in the 1980s got a crown from Burger King. I know you did. It's, this thing looks like a crown. It is just another disease or something designed by the enemy to bring dis-ease in your life. I think that it's pretty obvious the effect that disease can have on a whole multitude of people, even the people that don't have the dis-ease. There are a lot of people in infected with something much worse. There are a lot of people that are infected with the fear of not being at ease. Now, something should be, there should be some, some pictures, some dots that are being uh, connected now this morning for you because check this out. What I just read is, peace be still, he said in verse 39, and the wind ceased and there was a great calm. The Amplified Bible says a great calm, a perfect peacefulness. Peace accompanies with it, is accompanied by ease. A disease, something that is literally created by the God of this world, the wicked one. This dis-ease was created for the sole purpose of taking you out of peace. Now there's something deeper there, obviously, there is an ultimate place that the disease could go that could lead to physical death. Uh, I'm not even gonna talk about that right now because out of the 330 or 300 and something million people in the United States right now, uh, I don't know what the latest number is, but it's, it's measured in thousands, not millions. There are several thousands of people that are physically infected with this disease, but there are millions upon millions upon millions of people that are at dis-ease this morning. And so Matthew chapter four, verse 23, I wanna read one of the things that Jesus did. <clears throat> Matthew chapter four. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Jesus healed the people. He healed all manner of sickness. He healed all manner of dis-ease. It didn't matter where he went. In fact, Acts chapter 10, verse 38, <clears throat> excuse me, Acts 10, 38 shows you a definition of what the Father calls good. Glory be to God. It says that Jesus, Peter was preaching. And uh, I'll just read the whole thing. Hallelujah. Acts 10, I was just going to quote one section of the verse there, one line, but I'll, I'll read the whole thing. It says that uh, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. The Holy Ghost and power. Glory to God. Who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Jesus was anointed. He was empowered. He was, he, he was anointed with an anointing that removes burdens and destroys yokes. He was anointed for the specific purpose, glory to be to Jesus, to go about doing good. 
healing. <laughs> Doing good, healing. Friend, if that does not light your fire, I heard one preacher say your wood is wet a long time ago. I'm telling you right now that God calls healing good. So let's start right there. If there's any question, any question whatsoever about God's intent for you through this storm, God's intent for you through this whole thing, it's that you be healed. He thinks that that's good. Glory be to God. That disease has no rule in my life. It has a crown around it. Now, I'm not trying to take this whole crown thing too far this morning, but I, when I read it, I knew by the Holy Ghost that I was supposed to share this with you because it is trying so very hard right now to gain, Lord, to gain lordship and kingship in people's thoughts and in people's minds and in people's hearts. And this coronavirus does not rule my life. It doesn't have a crown worth anything in my life. In fact, Psalm chapter 8 Verses four and five says, what is man? What is man that you're mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? Verse five says, you have made him a little lower than uh, the angels or Elohim, the creator himself, made him a little lower than the angels and has crowned him, crowned him, crowned him with glory and honor. Crowned with glory and honor. Now, Adam left, left that to the birds. <laughs> he handed that glory and honor, that crown, that, that rulership, that kingship, that dominion that God gave him in the very first chapter, he gave that over to Satan. And I want to share with you in Matthew chapter four, I shared about this a few um, weeks ago. And it's the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. So literally, this is how he was, he was baptized into ministry at the end of Matthew uh, chapter 3. He, uh, verse 17 is the last verse in that chapter. It says, low a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So Jesus is baptized. He's set apart into the ministry and immediately. The very first thing he does was go out in the wilderness to be tempted of the devil of the devil. The temptation comes of the devil. In fact, God said in the book of James, uh, the word says that let no man say when he's tempted that he's tempted of God. God doesn't do the tempting. The enemy does the tempting. And so Jesus goes to the wilderness to be tempted. And you guys know the story. I'm not going to go too long into this, but I'm just going to say a couple of things. Uh, the first temptation was to command the stones to be made bread. He attacked Jesus at his very um, lowest temptation. Uh, it was the one that Adam and Eve fell for. It was food. Uh, so he attacked Jesus with food, and Jesus said, no, nah, even after fasting for 40 days. I just recently did a seven-day fast, and I know I would be tempted by a piece of bread, but uh, here's the thing. Uh, Jesus, after 40 days, he said, no, nah, uh, I'm not going to live by bread alone. You guys know the story, but now come on down. The second temptation. The devil, verse 5, taketh him up to the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, the very top of the temple. And said to him, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written. Oh, nice try, Mr. Devil. Nice try coming at me with the word, Mr. Devil. It is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands sh they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone. Now, here's the deal. Jesus knew the word way better than Satan did. Um, and so it's very evident here that Satan deliberately left out a key phrase. He's quoting Psalm 91. Just a couple weeks ago, we prayed this prayer over our whole church. I prayed over my family often. But Psalm chapter 91, verses uh, 11 and 12. Let's read that. Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12. He shall give his angels charge over thee. Watch this to keep thee in all thy ways, to keep thee in all thy ways. I want you to notice that Satan left that phrase out. When he tempted Jesus, he said, he'll give his angels charge over thee. Skip to verse 12, please. That they shall bear thee up. Now he left out the key phrase to keep thee in all thy ways. Jesus knew that there was a way. There was a path for him to take, and he was going to go to the cross and obtain legally that righteous crown, that rulership crown for man. He took on the form of a servant. He took on human flesh so that a man, the man Christ Jesus, he was all God and all man, but make no mistake, a man 
full of the Holy Ghost and full of power, went in and whipped the devil, stripped him absolutely of all his authority, beat him to a pulp, just like he beat that wind in Mark 4 to a pulp, and said, came out of there and said to the captives, led the captivity captive and took them and they were in the first load, so to speak. And glory be to God, we have now been crowned. We got back the crown of glory and honor. Glory be to God. Glory and honor that Adam lost. So we've got our crown back. Tell your kids or tell your spouse they're sitting on the couch with you, we've got our crown back, glory to God. Now I want to talk to you about this really quickly before I close this segment here. Man was crowned with glory and honor and Jesus got it back the right way. But I want you to see how Jesus got it back. This is going to speak to you. Please turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 17 and 18. Because here's the thing. Jesus did not receive, you can take that verse off the screen for just a second. I don't want them reading ahead. Jesus didn't receive glory and honor after he whipped Satan, and after he arose, and after he went back to, uh, to, the, to the throne room of God. You would think that that was when he was crowned majesty, and that was when you, you, would, you would have the picture, at least, I have in the past, you would have the picture of, of Jesus being risen up a conquering king. But here's the thing I want you to see. Verse 17 of 2 Peter chapter 1. For he, Jesus, I'm going to back up to verse 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. What's that word majesty? That's a kingdom word. They were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So he didn't receive this crown. He didn't receive this majestic crown. Uh, position with the Father after he went through everything and, and, and went and sat at the right hand of the Father. No, he did not get that then. They witnessed his majesty. The whole time he walked around this earth, he walked around as king and as ruler over all of these situations and circumstances, whether it was the madman of Gadara, the storm that we read about in Mark chapter 4, Jairus' daughter when he, when he spoke to uh, uh, Jairus to fear not believe only, the woman with the issue of blood that grabbed hold of his prayer shawl, uh, the, the centurion servant um, that, that came, the, the centurion spokesperson that came and talked to Jesus and he said, hey, you don't have to come to my house, just speak the word only and he'll be healed. Jesus exercised his majesty in every single one of those examples. Glory be to God standing in front of the tomb of Lazarus or, oh my goodness, there's just so many coming up on the inside of me right now. Dozens of times Jesus showed his majesty and these men, Peter being one of them, these men were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now, when did he get it? Verse 17, for he received from God the Father honor and glory. Does that sound familiar? Psalm chapter eight, verse five crowned him who is man that you've crowned him with glory and honor. Look, Jesus received the same thing. He received from God, the Father, honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hallelujah. Oh, glory be to God. I just feel the weight of it all over me right now. Jesus Christ of Nazareth from the very beginning the very beginning of his ministry. When the heavenly father said, coming up out of that water, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That pleased the father to say that. He, he exercised his kingship, the king, the father king. Exercised his dominion and his rule by conferring on Jesus honor and glory. And Jesus was a type for you this morning. If you're in Christ, he's a type for you. If you are in Christ, if you've been made a partaker of his being his body, the body of Christ, you've been crowned with glory and honor. The Father has put back 
on you the very thing that Adam was created to dominate this planet with. It's on the inside of you. Adam was supposed to dominate the world. You're supposed to dominate your world. It's by glory and by honor. God honored you and you honor God. There's an honor connection there. Hallelujah. That is so precious. And the glory of God is what will absolutely dominate all your needs. All your needs are supplied by his riches inherent inside that glory. And so I just want to finish right here this segment by saying this. Hallelujah. In the Hebrew, in the Old Covenant, the word for banks, the banks of a river, is the Hebrew word safa, S A. P-H-A-H, Safa. Now watch this. I want you to see this. It's the same word. It's the same Hebrew word for lips. Now, any of you that have ever been fishing in a river uh, or on the bank of a river, you understand that you can fall over the lip of that river at any moment. There's a lip there that divides the river and the non-river. <laughs> It's the same, same Hebrew word, safa. The river is literally created. Get this. The river is literally created to flow between the two banks or between the two lips. The river of God is inherent on the inside of you. John chapter 7 Verse 38, I won't turn there right now, but Jesus said, out of your, if you believe on me, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Jesus said that that is the way that you're going to affect your world. That's the way that you're going to affect your world. The river, the mighty rushing river of the Holy Ghost is supposed to come out of your belly. And how does it get out? How does it get out of your belly? Well, Jesus said, out of the abundance of your heart, out, how does it get out of there? How does it get out of there? Out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. The river has got to flow between your lips. And I'm just, I'll stop short of commanding you by the authority of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I'm telling you, you've got to let the river flow. Letting the, letting the river flow is not just laying on your face and hoping that, that God's river rushes. No, you've got the river on the inside of you. You've got the river. You've got the source on the inside of you. And it, it just, oh, it's just itching to come out. It wants to come out more than you want it to come out. And when you align your lips and allow that river to flow between the two lips, the banks, of your life that will dictate and dominate where that river flows. Glory be to God. You'll see some things. You'll see some change like you've never seen before. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. I'm so thankful that Jesus is Lord. Amen. Give a good amen to Jesus this morning. Hallelujah. Now, before we, before we move on, I feel compelled by the Holy Spirit. I feel an unction to pray this morning, to pray over this virus, to pray over your families, to pray uh, over this nation, to pray for our leaders. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. I'm going to read a verse. Most people misquote this verse of Scripture. In fact, before they even put it on the screen, uh, if I were to say, uh, if I were to say, who are you supposed to pray for first? And I especially, if I said, you know, 1 Timothy chapter 2, if I said that verse of Scripture, there's no doubt that you would say we're supposed to pray for our leaders first. Well, with all due respect, you'd be wrong because the Word of God says something here. Let's read the verses. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. It doesn't say to pray for leaders first. It says, first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. We're called to pray for all men. Now it gets specific in verse 2. Watch this. For kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this 
is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Watch this now, verse 4. Who will have all men to be saved? He desires, verse 4 in the Amplified says, who wishes all men to be saved. But back to the King James. Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth? So I want you to see this. We're going to pray for our president. We're going to pray for our vice president. We're going to pray for our governor. We're going to pray for uh, the, the, the leaders at the CDC and all these places um, for the wisdom of God to be all over their decisions and be all over them. But I want you to see this, that the prayer for them is so that all men could have what? A good and ex uh, a quiet and peaceable life. See, we pray for leadership so that all men can have an opportunity. We pray for world leaders so that the, the men and the women and the children under their um, leadership have an opportunity to be able to live a quiet, a peaceable life. Now, who's the one that gives peace? You know the answer. The Prince of Peace himself. It's the fruit of the Spirit. So let's pray this morning. I want you to be active in your living rooms. I want you to be super, super active in this. You pray in the Holy Ghost. You pray with me. Glory be to God. Like I said earlier, there's no time or distance or space in prayer. Uh, we are all one body. Glory be to God. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you and I give you honor and I give you glory. First of all, Father, I pray for all men. I pray for every single man, woman, and child in this world. I'm going to go all the way around the world here. And I'm not just talking about the city or our state or our nation, Father. I'm praying for all men. I'm praying for mankind this morning that a hush, a muzzle, would be put over the storms of life. I pray right now in the name of Jesus that every man, woman, and child under the sound of my voice can understand what the hope is that you have, the hope is that's in the calling, the great calling of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you. I give you glory and honor. And Father, so we pray for our leadership. I'll specifically, I'll pray for all the world leaders, Father, that your hand would be on them. I don't care if they're Hindu or Muslim or agnostic or uh, atheist. I don't care who they, what they think that they identify with, Father. I pray for them that your Holy Spirit speak to their heart and they would hear you. You're speaking, you're wooing every man, woman, and child on this planet right now. That's who you are, you love us. That's what love does. Glory be to God. I thank you, Father. Oh, my Father, do I thank you. Now, Father, I pray for President Trump, Vice President Pence. I pray, Father, for all the cabinet uh, members and the leaders of the different departments, the Secretary of State and the uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services, and, and just, I, I, I'm not going to name them all, Father, this morning, but Father, you know that the, that the, the, the righteous prayer, mm, the prayer of a righteous man avails much. And I stand here just like Jesus did in front of the tomb of Lazarus. And I say boldly, Father, I thank thee that thou hearest me always. You hear my prayer. You hear my cry this morning. You hear the cry of your people over this virus and over this, uh, this mountain, this storm that needs to be muzzled and ceased and be stilled right now in the name of Jesus. I speak to coronavirus right now. I will not even call you that anymore. I speak to you peasant virus. You've got no crown in my life. I speak to you peasant virus right now to line up with the word of God. You are part of the curse and I curse you in the name of Jesus. I bind you according to Matthew chapter 16. Whatever I bind on earth shall be what is already bound in heaven and there's no peasant virus allowed to even tiptoe its way into heavenly places or heavenly realms. So I speak from my elevated authority position. I speak right now in the mighty name of Jesus against this peasant virus and I declare it to be dead on arrival when it comes to my house, dead on arrival when it tries to come to any of our partner's houses. Father, if they go to the store, if they go to the bank, if they go wherever. Father, I pray it would be just like John G. Lake. If that virus touches their hand, it just dies dead on arrival. It's got no place in any of our lives in the mighty name of Jesus. I thank you, Father. I give you glory. I give you honor. For Father, you've crowned me with glory and you've crowned me with honor but I give it all back to you. I give all the praise 
back to you for everything that you've made me to be, for everything that you've made us, your dear children and your dear church to be. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you for the authority that's on the inside of me. I speak to this storm, you will be muzzled. You will be muzzled. You don't have a voice in our life. The very atmosphere is muzzled, and the sea, the road, the journey that we're called to take is muzzled. And we will walk our path. We will go to the other side. We will make it to our destination that Jesus has told us aforetime and beforehand that we should go and we should be headed. So our eye is on the destination, Father. Our eye is not on the storm. Our eye is not on the sea. Our eye is not on the road. We're not even going to be looking to the road. We're going to be looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Glory be to God. I thank you for it and give you praise for it in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Glory to God. I don't know what it's like right now in your living room, but I can tell you right now what it's like here. And um, I don't know if you camera operators can testify to this. Oh, they got their hands up. Glory be to God. It is so thick in here. I'm telling you right now, the anointing is strong. And you just lay hold of that word. Amen. Lay hold of that word. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe to this channel and share this video with a friend today. And remember, most importantly, that Jesus is Lord and you are complete in Him.